done this before, but Jeff and Ida are social directors. So they've prepared some cool things. I understand we're going to have stadium hot dogs and stadium mustard. I used to go to the Indians games when they were lousy just because I liked the stadium mustard on the hot dogs. <laughs> now they're good, and it, you know the, the hot dogs taste even better since they're good. But we're also having, what else are we having? Does anybody know what kind of food is going down today? Nachos? Uh, just stadium food, right? Cracker Jack, chips. Yeah, looks good. Right, all right. Salted peanuts, Cracker Jacks. Oh, there's tater tots, pasta, and cake, too? Oh, really? You're making me hungry. All right, <laughs> service is dismissed. We're going to eat now. <laughs> I'll try not to go too long here. Uh, I don't know if you saw my Facebook page, those of you that follow me on Facebook, but uh, my birthday is coming up. It's not just any birthday. It's coming up April 30th, and it's the big 6-0, Kendra. 60. And I know Kendra's thinking, he looks 39. <laughs> it's not possible. You're right, I'm totally lying. I'm 39. And, yeah. Hey, who said that over there? Watch it. I resemble that remark. Um, but I, there's something I want to ask you uh, for. And you have a whole week to do it because next Sunday's the 29th. Uh, I love insulting birthday cards, I love them. I don't care. Nothing's off limits. Uh, you're getting old. You're getting fat. You're getting bald. Your nose is big. And whatever it is, you're, lo you're getting senile. I don't care. It's okay. I'm asking you as a favor to me. Insult me. <laughs> Give me the funniest, nastiest-ish, birth nastiest-ish, if that's a word, birthday. <laughs> Not too nasty, but... Uh, and you can get multiple cards. You can get five if you want. Yeah, I mean, as many as you want. If you see some good ones... And what I'm going to do the weeks after my birthday is I'm going to read them before I speak from the pulpit. And I'll take a few weeks to do that if I get enough, and there'll be prizes. For the best, the funniest, the most insulting, etc. And there's going to be wonderful prizes, by the way. Things like candy bars, and uh, no, it's, I don't know what the prizes are going to be yet, but there will be them. So I, I would appreciate that. We'll have a lot of fun with that. All right, I did hear a story this week, and... Uh, uh, it comes from, uh, actually, Mark Powers sent me this, and, uh, and it's about it. There's a bus full of ugly, really nasty-looking people. <laughs> you know, just think of the ugliest person you've ever seen multiplied by 10. And so there's a busload of these people. They have a head-on collision with a truck. And when they died, God granted all of them one wish. The first person said, wow, that's great. I, I want to be gorgeous. God said, okay, and wham, he was gorgeous. And uh, the next person said the same thing. God snapped his fingers. Beautiful again, handsome. And he, the whole bus full of people uh, all asked for the same thing. And then there was one guy left, and the guy's rolling around on the ground. He's laughing hysterically. He can't contain himself. And uh, the Lord says, well, what are you laughing about? What's so funny? He said, well, I have the last wish, and uh, my wish is that they're all ugly again. <laughs> And that's Mark Powers for you. Hi, Mark. Mark's probably watching on uh, a live stream right now. So, hi, everybody out there in live stream land. Uh, we love you. We're glad that you're joining us, whether it's live or later recorded. But uh, I'm going to talk to you today about meditating on the Word of God. And uh, this is going to be special. So let's join hands and pray together over the Word. And let's just ask God to bless this time. Father, thank you for today. Thank you that every individual in this room is going to be touched by the power of God as we preach and teach the word under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, we welcome you. We ask you to just do whatever you want to do. And we'll be careful to cooperate with you. Father, pour your love out on each individual in this room. And Jesus, we thank you for your magnificent work on the cross. Pray that everyone comes into the good of that in this service today. In Jesus' name. And everybody says? Amen. 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 Bring, all right, praise God. All right, so, come on up here, would you? I'm going to, yeah. I hope you don't mind getting a little spit on you, because that's what's going to happen here. I have a little illustration. These are balloons, in case you didn't know. And uh, 
the, the Bible, let's read the scripture, and then I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. It's 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. Read it out loud. Uh, where is Steve? Do you have a microphone, Steve? Yeah, do you have a microphone? Matthew didn't ask you to. All right, let's read this together with me. Every scripture is God-breathed, given by his inspiration, and profitable for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error and discipline in obedience, and for training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's will, in thought, purpose, and action. All right, so... The scripture is given, it's God breathed, it says, given by inspiration of God, which means that God breathed the scripture into existence. And he used holy men of old. And um, he just basically breathed his word into them, and then they kind of exhaled it onto the page. And it became paper and ink, and it's come to us through the centuries. And there's something really powerful about the Bible. In fact, the word uh, spirit is the word pneuma in the Greek. Does anybody know what pneuma means? It means air or wind, and really more literally, it means a gentle blast of air. That's why in 1 John 3, 8, it says the wind blows where it wills. And so is everyone who's born of the Spirit of God. We're like that. The, the Spirit moves us and leads us and blows us, so to speak, into different places where we can exercise His will. But these holy men of old, people like Isaiah, you know, and Moses, and of course, you know, um, uh, John and the Apostle Paul, God breathed his word into them, and then they breathed it out on the page. So let me grab, give me one of these balloons, not all. This one's good, red one's good. All right, here we go. And okay, now, let's pretend you're the Apostle Paul, and you're just sitting there one day minding your own business, and God just comes along. Can you hear that? He starts, oh, that sounds nasty, doesn't it? So here God just breathes the word into you, right? So now you're sitting there and you're just pregnant with the word of God. And uh, now, grab one of those, well, here, just pretend this is a page that the Apostle Paul has in front of him. You're, you're the Apostle Paul and you're just filled with God, with the spirit of God. And so here, hand me one of those balloons and you take the one you got and you do the same thing but do it right onto the, if you can. That's what, That's what I asked for, he's right. <laughs> yeah, all right, let's let it go. He's noisy, isn't he? Wow. All right, so here you've got First Timothy now, all of a sudden. God breathed into him, and he exhaled onto the page. It's more than just people's thoughts or imaginations. The Word of God is... It's powerful. And this is how it came to us through Menifold. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. This is for all of you here. Okay. It was supposed to go off. I'm not sure why it didn't, but I was hoping it would fly around the room and hit Esteban right in the nose. <laughs> Does someone have the microphone now? Okay, so you're ready for the next one. All right, let's go to the next scripture. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The word can be used to kill. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's my part. <laughs> Just read the scriptures, brother, and I'll do the preaching. <laughs> he wants to preach so bad, you know. All right, so, yeah, the Word of God, it's true. The Word of God, as wonderful as it is, I have seen it used to kill. I've seen the Word of God used to beat people. I've seen preachers use it to beat people up, to make them feel hopeless and rotten and worthless. And, and I've been in churches like that. Man, I was in one church where the, Cindy and I, we were going up and we were repenting and crying every week after the sermon. And finally, the preacher came over us and said, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to all the rotten sinners that sit in the back row. Oh. Now, as I matured in Christ, I'm like, I'm not sure he's supposed to even be talking to them like that or anybody like that, really. Because he wasn't really using the word to build up people. He was using the word to tear them down 
even control them. And I hate to tell you that some preachers do that. How many of you know that preachers are not always perfect? Yeah, they can't always be like me, Carlos. You know, it's just... <laughs> no, but hey. So, the word can be used to discourage and demean and hamper and handicap and, and frustrate people. Now, the word, the Bible, and hear me out now, cause, uh, uh, the word of God uh, has no innate power of its own. Without the Holy Spirit, this Bible is just paper and ink, okay? The Holy Spirit is what makes it alive to us. In conjunction, though, with the Holy Spirit, when you get the Word and the Spirit together, the Word, say everybody, say it with me, the, whole, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. When those things are in operation together, it's powerful. It is impactful and it changes lives. And that the, God can use the Word through the Holy Spirit to encourage rather than discourage. He can use the Bible to rebuke people, but rebuke them in love and not make them feel hopeless, like dirty, rotten sinners. They, you know, they're, they're no good, they're not worth anything. The word can be used to edify. What does edify mean? It means to build you up, not tear you down, build you up. That's our goal here at the Father's House, is to use the Bible the way it was meant to be used. You know, the Bible is simply God's love letter to man. It's not hate mail. It's not fake news. Right? The Bible, there's truth and love and power, and the heart of God is on every page of the Word. And it's, the Bible speaks to people's potential. You see people in the Bible that just were really messed up, and uh, some of them ended up doing great, like the Apostle Paul himself. He was a murderer of Christians before he found Christ. He was a zealous Jew, and on religious grounds, he was killing people like you, and me, sending him to heaven early. But then God met him, and he met God on the road to Emmaus. It completely changed his outlook and the things that he did. He became a lover of God's people. Napoleon Bonaparte. How many of you know who Napoleon Bonaparte was? Controvert. Really? How many know who Napoleon was? It's, wow, we need more schooling. I think we did. Did you pay attention in history? Um, but Napoleon Bonaparte, he was uh, the leader of France. And he's a controversial figure, but all the things I've read about him, uh, you know, some people think he was bad, uh, some people think he was terrific. And I guess uh, it just depends who you believe. But he said this about the Bible. The Bible is no mere book, but a living creature with a power to conquer all who oppose it. And that is so true because the Bible has had so much opposition and so many people have tried to stamp it out wipe it out, wipe it off the face of the earth. And if you study just the history of the scripture and how it came to us, it's, a, it's miraculous. It's God, not only that it's here, but it's the best-selling book of all time, bar none. Amen? So, now, I ask you a question. Is it important for us as Christians to get into the Word of God? Yeah. Is it important for you personally to get into God's Word? Yeah, you don't want to just depend on me for all of your feeding from the scripture. But as a pastor, teacher, I don't like to give people a dictum, an authoritative comment. In other words, you know, like, read the word, read the word, read the word. There's something in me as a pastor, teacher, that also uh, makes me understand, I need to tell you how. I need to help you do it better. I need to give you the how-to. How do I get into the scripture in a way that's going to be meaningful? How many of you have ever picked up your Bible and you read a, you know, a whole, like a whole chapter and you felt like you got nothing or not much out of it? Yeah, that's happened to... Tell, raise your hand, be honest. It's happened to me. Okay. So, it's not enough just to tell you to read your Bible. Uh, Nikita Khrushchev was the leader of Russia for a long time. He had memorized two-thirds of the New Testament. Anybody here got two-thirds of the New Testament memorized? No. And yet, he was an atheist. So just reading it and even memorizing it is not enough. There has to be more. It has to be internalized in some way. And I'm going to actually show you at the end of this how to do that. I'm going to give you an actual live demonstration. It's not prepared, not rehearsed at all. This is like reality television. If you're watching on live stream, you're, this is a reality show for you today, okay? 
we don't know what's going to happen here. Um, now, I want to talk about this one aspect of the scripture, and that is meditating on the Word of God. I'm not talking to you today about reading through the Bible, all as good as that is. I'm not talking about intensive Bible study. This scripture is narrowed, this, ver, this uh, message, this sermon today, is narrowed down to how you can meditate that one aspect. How do you meditate on the Word of God? So now, when you hear the word meditation, in today's world, a lot of people think that you're talking about New Age stuff or Middle, Middle Eastern stuff, okay? Uh, including Google. Uh, when I first studied this out 30-some years ago, the word meditation, everything was different. Dictionaries, they all looked at meditation from a, either a secular or a Christian perspective. Not so anymore. The influence of uh, really uh, the recent years, especially the last eight or ten years, has made us think in a, mid, in, in, a, in, a, in a more accepting of things that we used to not accept as a Christian nation. Here's what Google now says in the year 2018 about meditation. It, it's the definition says think to meditate is to think deeply or focus one's mind for a period of time in silence and with the aid of chanting. Hello? Does anybody get have bells go off when you hear that? With the aid of chanting for religious or spiritual purposes or as a method of relaxation. Now, I read a quite a, and a, most dictionaries said similar things. They talked about the, your mantra and chakra and all this stuff. And uh, the worst uh, that I found was Yoga International. Yoga International. And so many people are, you know, do yoga today, and I'm not saying that there's a connection. There may or may not be. But Yoga International issued an authoritative-sounding public statement that they had the real truth on meditation. Aren't you glad that Yoga International is going to correct us from all these centuries of bad thinking, Christian thinking? They're going to tell us what it really is, okay? And put it up on screen so everybody can see this. The real meaning of meditation by who? Swami Rama. Swami Rama. Say that fast ten times. No, don't say that. No. I'm, I'm pretty sure Swami Rama is not a, a Christian pastor. How about you? A Swami is a male Hindu religious teacher. Okay? And they're telling us that Swami Rama has the real truth on what meditation is. And he says, meditation is a word that's come to be used loosely and inaccurately in the modern world. That is why there's so much confusion about how to practice it. Some people use the word meditate when they mean thinking or contemplating. Others use it to refer to daydreaming or fantasizing. Now, let me just tell you something. Just a little spoiler. The word meditation in the English language and in, in prior English dictionaries actually was uh, thinking or contemplating. But he's telling us, oh no, that's not what it means. I'm, he's, I, this Swami, am going to give you the, the truth right now. Okay? <laughs> what is meditation? All right, he says, however, meditation, and this is a word, D H Y A N A, Diana. That's the word he's using for meditation. Dhyana, or dhyana, is not any of these. What, what is meditation? Meditation is a precise technique for resting the mind and attaining a state of consciousness that is totally different from the normal waking state. It is the means of fathoming all the levels of yourself. Now, I'm kind of a shallow person. I only have one level. My level is Mike. I'm Mike. You're Dustin. You're Katie. But it's the Swami. There's many levels to you, Dustin. Did you know that? Level. You need an elevator inside of you just to get to the, all the levels that are inside of you. All the levels of ourselves and finally experiencing the center of our consciousness. Hum. Okay. Medi 
I'm sorry. I'm, I'm being intentionally facetious. and Just forgive me. I'm ornery. Uh, meditation is not a part of any religion. It's a science, which means that the process of meditation follows a particular order, has definite principles, and produces results that can be verified. So you can be a verifiable kook. Did you know that? This is really, this is big news here. The problem, folks, is that the word dhyana or dhyana is a Hindu-Buddhist reference. And its origins are in ancient Sanskrit, ancient San which is an ancient Indian language. It's not English or Greek or Christian or Hebrew in any way. Okay? It is something else. It's what the Bible itself called another gospel or a different gospel than the one that was preached and handed down to us. Uh, now, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, however, how many of you knew that Noah Webster was a devout Christian? He loved the Lord. So that dictionary has strong Christian roots, and it describes the word meditation as simply reflection or contemplation, which is the normal, non-kooky, non-trying to recruit you to be something, secular <laughs> word for... But... There's a Hebrew word for meditation in the Bible. Listen, meditation was God's idea. Meditation is not some Middle Eastern, it wasn't Buddha's idea. Uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, I mean, some of these people, they, get, they're, they are in their grave, folks. There's one, one great, one fantastic divine individual who was sent here by God to save us from our sins, and his grave is empty. All these other people, you go to their tombs, you're going to find their bones, okay? Jesus is the only one that actually raised from the dead, proving, it says in Romans, that he was indeed the Son of God. The resurrection proved that he was who he said he was. This Hebrew word is, that is translated meditation, it's haga, H-A-G-A-H. Haga has multiple meanings. It means to utter, to speak, to talk about it. See, as you approach the word, all these things are involved in meditating on the word of God. It means to meditate, to muse, to imagine. It means to roar, growl, groan, and moan. How many of you have ever spoken or even shouted the word forcefully at times? For instance, when the enemy was involved in something. And you just said, you know, I take authority over you, the name of Jesus. There's, or, there's no weapon formed against me or this person is going to prosper. You see... So there's times when you come very aggressively with the Word of God. And the fourth is to ponder and to study the Word of God, to think about it, to roll it around in your mind. Read Joshua 1.8, Steve, would you please? It's up on screen. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe and do according to all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall deal wisely and have good success. Hooray for the word of God. Amen. Amen. All right, so it says it's not going to depart out of your what? Your mind, your heart, or what? Your mouth. So your mouth is involved at times in meditating on the word of God. Uh, it says you're going to meditate on it once in a while, or how? What, how? Day, and Day and night. That's interesting. We're going to talk about that in a moment. You're going to do what's in the word. There, I have a wonderful three-word statement for you. This will change your life. Are you ready? Do the word. Look at your life. Wherever your life's not lined up with the word, change it and do the word. Whatever you're doing. I don't care if it's a relationship. I don't care if it's things that you watch, things that you listen to, uh, people you associate with, places you hang out. If it's not biblical stop doing it how many people have I seen I've, I've been saved since 1974 I've encountered a lot of people I've been in ministry since 86 that's a long time and I can solve everyone's problem listen you come to me with whatever your problem whatever your problem is do the word I don't have a job pastor Mike well make it your full time job to get a job until you find a job Get up in the morning, start at 8 or 9, 
start making phone calls or get on your computer and start putting out resumes and do that 40 hours a week until you get work. You know why? Because the Bible says if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. Oh, you're so hard, Pastor Mike. I didn't write that. God wrote that, but he writes these things for our good. Stop whining and I don't have this and I don't have that and I need this and I need people to, you know, honestly, find a job. And the reason that, and I'm, can I be a little tough on you today? The reason that a lot of even Christians don't have a job is because they don't make it their job, their full-time job, to find a job until they get a job. Does that make sense, Mike? I was out of work one time. I started a Monday morning. Blam. I got on the phone. This is a ways back. There was no internet, by the way. Until Al Gore invented it. There was no internet. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and I'm ornery today. And uh, I got on the phone Monday morning. Started, I started in the, with the phone book in the A section. I started calling. I think you can still do that. There's still telephones today, right? Like if you're sitting around the house watching TV, playing video games, or sleeping until one in the afternoon, or whatever your issue is, I promise you that's not godly, that God can't bless that. You've got to give him something to bless. If you want a garden, you can't not plant anything and go yell at the garden, because there's nothing there. You've got to plant some seed there, right? And then, then you can say, hey, where's my tomatoes? Where's my lettuce? We gotta get rid of those rabbits. They're eating all the big green. You, know, you know what I'm saying? But if you don't plant anything, why are you up, why are you mad at anybody else except yourself? And it's counterproductive to be mad at yourself. Just do the word. If you don't work, you don't eat. I know that's for some of you people out there in in uh, internet land as well. Spend forty hours looking for a job and praying. And you'll get a job. Pray, God, give me a job, and then get to work. Nine to five, looking for work. I don't know what to do. There's lots to do. Start with the phone. Are you hiring? Can I interview? Do, I, do you want a resume? You want it in the mail? Do you want it on the, the internet? How do you want that? And then you do that. That, folks, okay, where is that in the word, Pastor Mike? If you don't work, you don't eat. That's where it is. And the Bible commends hard work, and it, com it commends diligence, and it comes against slothfulness and laziness. It's said about the lazy man, and this is not in my notes at all, but I know this is for maybe some people here or some people watching over the internet. It says the lazy man is so lazy, he can't even get his fork from the dish to his mouth to eat. There are people that are looking for other people to do everything for them. Everything. And I'm sorry, that is ungodly. Okay. All right, enough of that. Say amen. amen. Say thank God he stopped. No, don't say that. <laughs> now, it says in this scripture here that we just read, that if you observe and you do according to all that's in it, then you're going to make your way what? Prosperous. Does anybody have anything against prosperity here? Because I've met a lot of people, it seems like they do. Oh, I don't want to make too much money. I don't want to get a job because then I would have to stop being poor and miserable. Okay. But see, here's the thing. If you do what the Word says, you feel better about yourself. You're tired at the end of the day, but it's a good tired. You did something productive. People that are lazy are also usually very depressed because they're down on themselves. Do you follow what I'm saying? I don't know. I've worked since I was 15 years old. And I have a hard time paying tax. I see myself paying all these taxes and then people taking advantage of that are able-bodied. Now, if someone is truly uh, handicapped or the pol politically correct word is physically challenged, uh, fine. No problem. We want to bless you. We bless That's why we have a food ministry. We want to bless people with groceries and good things. But it says you'll be prosperous and then you'll deal wisely and have good success. You know, those two things go together, don't they? When God gives you wisdom after you have been the person that meditates on the Word, wisdom just flows to you and it flows through you. It's amazing. 
It makes you prosperous and successful in everything, and it gives you divine wisdom so you know what to do and say in every situation. Now, there's people, I, you know, I do a lot of counseling. And uh, I have a lot of people, and I, it's very kind. I mean, they say, boy, you're really wise. Or, wow, just the wisdom is amazing. You know, I think mean, Mark Power said that to me yesterday. I'm like, well, honestly, <laughs> sometimes I'll say things, and people go, oh, that's so wise. Where did you come up with that? And I'm thinking, did they hear what I actually said? Or did the Holy Spirit just talk over me and drown me out? <laughs> like, I'm, like I'm, it's almost like I'm saying, bleh, 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 and the Holy Spirit says, and you shall go forth. And you shall, you know, I'm like, you know, I don't feel, I feel, you know, incredibly shallow sometimes. But, you know, the Holy Spirit gives you words when you're in the moment. And you speak those words. And if you just will listen, he will talk. And then he'll give you what to say in every, any and every get you, uh, situation. Now, John 6, can you read that scripture? Verse 63. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Amen. So meditating on the word of God, what it does is it turns the letter of the word back into its original form, which was spirit. Do you hear that? When you meditate on the word of God, not just read it or not just do a study, but you meditate on it. You take a passage or even one single verse and we're going to teach you how to meditate, and you do that, it takes that written word off the page, and it becomes spirit, and it, wham, it goes right into you. It becomes part of you, becomes part of who you are. The word of God actually literally does that, and it becomes a vital part of your spiritual DNA going forward for the rest of your life. That's why King David wrote, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. When you read the word and you meditate on it, it, it fills your memory banks, it fills your heart and your spirit, and it changes how you live your life. It gives you wisdom, it gives you intelligence. There's nothing wrong with intelligence, by the way. I know a lot of people think intelligence and Christian, there are two words that just, <laughs> they're not always, you know, but God, I, I really encourage you as believers to also use your mind, your intellect. Let it be submitted to the spirit within you but don't be afraid to use it. God gave you that brain for a purpose. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to yes. the division of soul and spirit, yes. and of joints and marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents, motivations, agendas of the heart. Yeah, this is what meditating on the word will do for you. It will separate, separate your soul from your spirit in how you live your life. Now, a lot of people don't know what the soul... How many of you know the difference between your soul and your spirit? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you don't, don't know? I mean, if you don't know, I'll give you a brief explanation. All right. A lot of people think the soul and the spirit are the same thing. Let me give you a little clue of Bible study. When it's a different word, it's a different thing. Does that make sense? If it meant to say spirit, it would say spirit. If it meant to say soul, it'll say soul. What is the soul? Well, how does it differ from the spirit? Because they're both internal. All right. God is a triune being. What does that mean? He is three. He is three, and these three are one. He is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. These three are one. All right. So, one God, different functions, different personalities. The Father it pours out his love. If you look at uh, the benediction at the end of 2 Corinthians, the last thing Paul says is uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In that beautiful scripture, he encapsulates what the Father, Son, and the Spirit about. The grace of Jesus speaks of his great sacrifice for you and me on the cross. How many say yay? Thank you Jesus for that. What he went through for you. So you didn't have to go through that. So you wouldn't have to face hell. So you had the opportunity to be saved. 
It does, it's not an automatic thing. He gave you the opportunity to make a choice because God does, has never taken freedom of choice from us. We, have, we choose everything. Tomorrow, you're going to choose how you live your day. Pam, you're going to choose how to, if you're going to live by the word or if you're going to live by the flesh. That's going to be every day we have a choice. I choose to live by the word as much as possible in my life. I hope you do too. Jesus provided that because he saved you. You're not going to hell. You're going to be with God for all eternity if you, if you are a Christian. If you have asked Christ personally and definitely to be your Lord and Savior. If he lives in your heart. If you're a follower of him, you are headed for heaven. If not, I'm sorry to tell you, but there is a literal hell. There's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. I hope everybody in this room is shunning that hell. And if not, you're going to get a chance to go from someone, you're going to change from a have not to a have in just a matter of minutes here. If you don't personally know Christ. It says the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. The Father is all about love. He pours out his love to you. He wants you to know him, uh, Carrie, not as just some far off God who's judging you. God's not, he doesn't judge. He loves. Now there is judgment awaiting all of us in, in that day. But when you come into the good of what Christ did, then all of a sudden the love of God becomes available to you. You have a daddy who cares. Some of you didn't know a father's love growing up. Some did. But there's a lot of people in this society that are fatherless. There's a lot of people in this church that are fatherless. And you could have had a father on the scene and still been fatherless. There are a lot of men who are workaholics. They don't know how to show affection. They hide behind their newspaper when they are home. Never do anything with their children. See? And that produces children that are fatherless. Divorces and broken homes cause a degree of fatherlessness in people's lives because dad is absent for so much of the time. It's hard for dad to be a father when he's only got the kids every so often, you see. And then there are fathers who just flat out disappear. They leave the mother with a child and the child, there's a lot of people, there's people in this room, I'm sure you don't know your father or you've only seen him a few times and he doesn't really care to look in on you or to call you or spend time with you. And that does damage to people's hearts and souls, you see. And, then, and, and also there are fathers who are abusive. Verbally, sexually, emotionally abusive to children. And that wreaks havoc on a person's psyche and how they react and respond to life. And so here is the triune God who is all these things to us. And then, of course, it says in that scripture and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. It gives you an idea of what he's all about. He wants to talk to you. The Holy Spirit wants to hang out with you. He's all about fellowship. Did you know you can talk to the Holy Spirit? Do you know why you can talk to him? Because he's right here. Everybody just go like this. Just like this. That's you and the Holy Spirit. He's, listen, how you think I'm joking? He's called the paraclete in the Bible. That means he's the one that's called alongside you to help you with everything in life. He's always speaking to us. The question is, are we listening? And he speaks in different ways. He doesn't speak the way I do with dumb jokes and, you know, practical jokes and all that. He's not like me. He's nicer. He's cool. And he wants to talk to you about everything in your life, not just things that you deem as religious or holy things. He's interested in your job. He's interested in your marriage. He's interested in your finances. He's interested in the day-to-day -day tasks. You can talk to him while you're doing dishes, and you can talk to him about the dishes you're doing. He just craves fellowship. He, he is that. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Okay, so, you have this triune God. Now, God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Is that correct? All the way back in Genesis, right? You notice God didn't say, I'm going to make man in my image. 
He said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God is triune, and therefore he made you and me triune. Did you know that you're three parts? Yeah, I'm a three-part being. Great looks, great personality, great sense of humor. That's me. No, that's not, that's not the three parts. Uh, he gave you a body, right? How many of you have a body? You wouldn't be here if you didn't. He also gave you a soul and a spirit. Those are the three parts of man. So you have the body, it's a container of all these inward things. Now the soul and the spirit, they differ because the soul is what comprises essentially your personality. The soul is what makes you uniquely you in the sense of you know, who you are, how you relate to people, how you relate to the world. Okay. Without the soul, it would be hard for you to you know, the soul enables you to speak, speak your mind, speak your heart, to have emotions, okay? The soul itself has three parts without getting too complex, but it's your mind. In other words, what you think about things. Out of your soul also comes your emotions, how you feel about things. And the third part of your soul is your will, what you do about things. The will is the choices you make based upon what you're thinking and what you're feeling. In most cases, the mind is the leading part of the soul. And, but some people are more emotional, and they, they lead with their emotions. That's fine. You do need some degree of logic so you don't uh, you know, invest all of your money in, uh, you know, in Cleveland Indian, no, not Cleveland Brown stock. Uh, you don't have, not, you know, that's not smart. But um, are you with me so far? So God is three-part, man is three-part. The soul is what I just said, it's essentially your personality. And your spirit is the third part of man. The spirit is the deepest part of you. And it's the part of you that contacts God directly. Are you, are you raise, your, raise your hand if I'm, I'm not going too fast, right? Are you following this? Now, the Bible says God is spirit. It doesn't say God is body or God is soul. The Bible clearly says God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You must use your spirit to truly have direct contact with God. We don't need to go into a confessional booth and tell our sins to a priest. We tell God. We, because Jesus immediately cleanses us when we confess our sins to God. He washes us clean, you see. So our spirit is, and there's three parts of the spirit. There's your intuition. Has anybody ever like had, a, had just a feeling about something that turned out to be right? It's yeah, just a gut feeling. Where does that come from? It's not your soul. It comes from your spirit. One part of this, that spirit is intuition. Another part of your spirit is conscience. How many of you ever did something wrong and then you felt really icky about it afterwards? Or even before you did it, yeah. That's one part of your spirit. It's another function, your conscience. John's writing feverishly, you know, you know and, you, and it's good stuff. But what I'm giving you is really good stuff here, brother. I'm talking about this all the time. And then uh, the last one is fellowship. Your con the spirit is conscience and intuition and fellowship. The fellowship part of your spirit is what allows you to have spiritual, spirit-to-spirit -spirit fellowship with God Almighty. It says in Psalms, deep calleth unto deep. And it's a capital D and a little d. His deep calls unto our deep. You feel God in your deepest part. You feel him. And he speaks to you there. That's where you hear God's voice is in your spirit. That is the fellowship aspect. It also enables you to fellowship with each other. In my, all right, in my spirit today, Jack, I looked at you and I knew. I just knew I needed to say something to you. Didn't know exactly what it was going to be until I opened my mouth and started. It's, it's faith. And the same thing with you, Carlos. I look, after I got done with Jack, I felt, Carlos, you know, I just it was feeling you, man. That's what young people say right now. I'm, I'm feeling you. You know, and uh, I'm going to be 60, so it's hard for me to you know, get these phrases. And they change every year. But, uh, and so out of my spirit, you see, it was that fellowship aspect that I just knew the Holy Spirit was telling me things about you and things to say to you. 
That's how it works. That is the, the triune God and the triune man. So do you have a better understanding of the difference between soul and spirit? They're both uh, invisible to the naked eye, but they have completely different functions. And what happens as we grow in Christ, as we meditate on the word, is the hope is that the spirit, our spirit begins to take more and more authority over our soul. It doesn't make the soul go away. I've heard people talk about it like, oh, the soul is bad, it needs to be stomped out. Not necessarily, the soul just needs to be under the dictums of the spirit. Because your spirit is where the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And if you're leading with your spirit instead of your mind or your emotions or will, guess what? You're going to, be, you're going to do the right things for the right reasons. Okay? And all of that comes from meditating on the Word of God. Meditation is a combination of reading and praying. Okay? You're not just reading like, a, I'm going to read a chapter, or I'm going to read ten chapters, or read through the Bible. Those are good things. I'm going to take a portion, however large or small, and I'm going to read and pray. I'm going to pray read that. Pray, if you're taking notes, pray dash read. Okay, I'm going to pray read the word today. And it's something that's wonderful to do every day. Yes, sir. Yeah, I do that often. Not every time, but I'll pray in the Spirit while I'm reading the Bible. God uses the power of the Holy Spirit to divide the mixture and compromise in your soul. That's what this scripture is talking about. It divides soul and spirit. The Word of God, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It says in this verse, it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents. In other words, what are your motivations? What's your agenda here? Has anybody ever been in a room, whether it's a business meeting or, I don't know, a sports, whatever, and you felt like you're hearing one thing, but there's somebody has an agenda that's beyond the words that are being spoken. People call that a hidden agenda. And believe it or not, even Christians have that sometimes. I know you're all, oh, oh you're shocked. Oh, I deal with it all the time. It's manipulations and, you know, and so the Holy Spirit cuts through all the baloney. When you meditate on the word, if you're honest, it cuts through the baloney that's inside of you. And it helps you grow out of that tendency to lie or to shade things or to try and work out everything that's going on around you with an angle that's going to benefit you. How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? Because I think everyone absolutely does. You're in conversations, you think, how's this going to play out for me? Even with our kids, how is this going to play out in my favor? Okay. Mom, I want to move to Nebraska. I've got a job opportunity. If you're a mother, you're tempted to try and discourage that kid. If you're meditating on the word, you're going to not discourage them or encourage them. You're going to look at the opportunity and the benefits. And you're going to be, in, if, if, if it all weighs in that child's favor, you're going to say, I think you should do it. We're going to miss you. You should do it. But there's telephones, there's Skype, we'll visit, you know. You see, th those are the kinds of things where your, a hidden agenda can arise. And you're starting to talk, you're trying to convince somebody of something that may not be good for them, but it's good for you. You know, you all know, come on, we're all manipulators at heart. We come out of the womb that way. I don't know about you, when I was a baby, my first word was not goo goo or gaga or dad dad or mama. My first word was mine mine and my second word was no right because of the fall of man in the garden we're all born in a sinful state and God allows us to exist in innocence as far as our eternal you know if, if someone passes away before they hit the age of accountability they go to heaven to be with Jesus I can prove that out from the book of Romans but when you hit that age of accountability, you have to reconcile yourself with God. You have to receive Christ and give your heart to Him. And so, the Word removes the manipulation, the hidden agendas, and it helps you come with honesty and integrity in all of your dealings. Be them with God or with man. 
And when you start getting to that place, it feels really good. When you get to the place where I don't care how it plays out, I'm going to say or do or I'm going to, it's going to be the right thing. I'm going to walk in the integrity of my heart given to me by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to try and manipulate one thing here. I'm just going to speak the truth, speak it in righteousness, and let the chips fall, and trust God with the results. How's that for a novel concept? Tell the truth, walk in integrity, and leave the results in God's hands. And when you do that, I want to tell you, sometimes the immediate results look bad and you're disappointed, but in the long term, you find God blesses you, and then you kind of go, I'm so glad I told the truth. I'm so glad I let meditating on the word change me to a person of integrity. All right, now we're going to wrap this up. Who wants a live, spontaneous, unrehearsed demonstration of me meditating on a scripture as I would do in the privacy of my own home? Anybody raise your hand if you would like that to happen. Okay. All right. Let's look at Psalm 101. This is one of my favorite scriptures. So now I'm, you know, I've gotten up and start my day and pick up my Bible and I look at Psalm 101. And here we go. And I'm going to try and pretend that you guys are not here for a few moments, okay? Now, it's with your mouth. Your mouth is involved. So oftentimes when I read the word, I'll read it out loud. I will sing of your love and justice. To you, Lord, I will sing praise. Lord, I thank you so much. I just praise you for who you are. And in some mornings, I might even sing a song to the Lord. I won't do that now for the sake of time, but I might sing a whole praise song. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. I worship you, my Lord and King. That is what I want to do. I give you praise. For you are my righteousness. I worship you, almighty God. There is none like you. I worship you, my king. You're beautiful to behold. You're everything to me. You mean so much to me, all the ways you've come through for me in my life. But even if you had never come through for me, I would still worship you. Because you are worthy. You're the King of Kings. You're the Lord of Lords. You're my Creator. You're my Father. You're my best friend, my counselor, my confidant. Thanks, Holy Spirit, for being here. Also, just helping me talk to the Father, talk to the Son. Help, helping me to meditate on the Word. Give me the stuff I need today, Spirit of God. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? Lord, I just want to live in a way that makes you proud. It makes you happy as my dad. I want you to look at me and say, that's my boy. And, and he's, he makes me proud. And I, Lord, I expect you as I do that, that you will come to me. Even in the night watches, that you'll come and minister to my heart, my soul, my mind. My emotions, my emotions get out of hand sometimes, and I need your help with that. Thanks for being there for me. And I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. Lord, help me lead my family the right way. Help me to be an encouragement, an example to them and to my wife. Lord, help me to do things and say things that encourage her, to talk about her day at work, or to praise her for just the great woman that she is, Lord. Help me to show me new ways that I can show my love to her. Whether it's sending her flowers or a stuffed animal at work or whatever it is, Lord, just show me how to lead my family the right way. And I will not look with approval at anything that's vile. And I hate what faithless people do. I will have no part in it. Father, help me to get the things that are vile and distracting and ugly. There's so much ugliness in the world. Father, and I understand why in Hebrews you said that, that your people, they were not of this world. And that the world was not worthy of them. And Lord, I know some of the great people that are Christian, that 
this world and the ugliness of it, the world is not worthy of them either. And I'm so glad that we have a destiny with you that where all that ugliness is going to be done away with. And the perverse of heart shall be far from me, and I'll have nothing, nothing to do with what is evil. Lord, I, I see people that are messed up and, and even perverse. Help me to be a witness to them. Help me to speak the word to them. But I'm not going to be a part of them. I'm not going to do the things that they do. And whoever slanders their neighbor in secret, I will put the silence. God, there's so many people who come to me and they say bad things about other people. As a pastor, Father, you know I hear it all the time. Help me to silence it. Show me ways that I can silence that without totally humiliating the person that are, that's saying it, but being an example and teaching them that they don't have to hate, they don't have to hold grudges, they can forgive. Help me to be a model of that. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, I will not tolerate. My eyes will be on the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. And no one who's and the one whose walk is blameless will minister to me. Lord, I see so many people doing wrong things intentionally. And it's hard for me at times to, to keep my spirits up, Lord. And so, God, help me to focus and think more about the faithful Christians than the unfaithful ones. As a pastor, sometimes, Lord, I feel like I deal with problem after problem with people. Lord, I thank God for, the, for our, the pastors in our church and the leaders and the people that are just doing right, people that are witnessing and reading their Bibles and they attend church regularly without fail. They don't blow off the, the assembling of themselves together. They're faithful in the things of God. I want to keep my eyes on them because when I do, I'm encouraged. Help me in my weakness, Father. Help me to watch those people. Help me to be encouraged by those people and to focus on them and not the ones that are not walking with you. The one whose walk is blameless will minister to me. No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. Every morning I'll put to silence all the wicked in the land. I'll cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. Lord, help me to govern the world around me properly, appropriately, and scripturally. All things in their right place. And help me, give me wisdom as to deal with the wicked that spontaneously comes my way in everyday life. Because every person is different. Show me what to do. I count on your wisdom as I meditate on your word. I thank you for this psalm. I thank you for this passage. Lord, just make it a part of me now forever. I want to live like this and I thank you for the word. I thank you Holy Spirit for helping me today. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Oh, you're all still here. <laughs> I really honestly forgot you existed, no offense, but you know. That's what happens when you get in your prayer closet with God. You forget that anyone else exists except for you and him. It's a very intimate moment with him. Amen. Did you get anything out of this today? Yeah. Was that live example helpful to you in your devotional time and your approaching the word? Good. I'm so glad. Does everybody in here know Jesus Christ? That's my next question. You know, the Bible says that uh, those that have the Son of God have life. Those that do not have the Son of God do not have life. And when I ask that question, there are some people that say, yes, absolutely. There are some people that say, honestly, no, I don't have the sun right now. Right As I sit right now, I don't. There are some that say, I think I have the sun. I think I'm saved. I think I'm going to heaven. I'm not sure. Let me just tell you something right now. If you're that middle person that you think you might be saved, you're probably not. Because, let me ask a saved person, Abby, are you a Christian? He said, absolutely. How do you know? How can you know that? Wow. So God forbid if you left this planet today, 
You're going, you know it, Bianca. How can she know that, folks? You know how? Because the word that we've been talking about all day, the word says, these things I've written to you, that you may know that you have eternal life. Those of you that believe in the Son of God. Listen, the Bible wasn't written so you could wish you have eternal life. God's too loving of a father to just let you go to bed at night wondering, if I die in my sleep, am I going to be in heaven or eternal hell and damnation? What does my future hold? The Bible tells you, you can know it. If you can know it, why wish it? You wouldn't treat the lottery that way. Do you know that you have the $10 million ticket? Or do you hope it? Well, I think I do. What's a, what's a person going to do with that ticket? They're going to find out for sure. And they're going to make sure they get that $10 million, right? right? Let me tell you, when you die, $10 million, $10 zillion is not worth a, one nothing. It's worth nothing. Your eternal soul is worth everything. I want you to bow your heads with me, if you would. Close your eyes. And I'm just going to ask each of you, and I see some new folks I haven't met. And... We care too much about you to not give you an opportunity. Think about your eternal soul. If you know Jesus Christ, he's your best friend and you love him more than anything else, more than anyone else. You love him more than your spouse or your children or your parents. I mean, you love them too and you love them a lot, but the Christian knows that they love Jesus more than anyone. And they know him. They know his personality, what he likes, what he doesn't like. I want to ask you if you're here today and you are not sure about this. I'm just going to give you an opportunity. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to make that right. To become a Christian. To change your eternal destiny. This is a moment just between you and God. This is a, a crossroads for you if you don't know him. How many would have the courage and the guts to say, Pastor Mike, I'm not sure that I know Jesus, but I want to I receive him today. I want to make sure that I'm going to go to heaven, that I'm going to be with him forever. Just slip your hand up and let me see it if that's you. God bless you. I see that hand and I see that hand as well. Praise the Lord. Is there anyone else here besides these two ladies? Say, Pastor Mike, I know that the Holy Spirit's talking to me too. I'm not sure. I want to be sure. This is my moment. This is your time. Everybody know? Jack, may I ask you, you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Jack, uh, Jack Richardson, was it, or? Goldie, would you tap the gentleman to your... Yeah. I just want to make sure. You know Christ as your Lord and Savior. I thought you did. I could sense that, but I wanted to make sure. Because I haven't met you yet. And uh, gentlemen, you're back there next to Ed. I don't know if you're friends with Ed, but right back by the nursery. Went. Ed, do you want to tap that gentleman on the shoulder? Ed. Hey, Ed. <laughs> Yeah, someone tapping. Hi, I haven't met you. Uh, my name's Mike. What's yours? Your name's Mike also? Did you ever notice that everybody named Mike is brilliant and good looking? I thought you might agree with that, yeah. And rich too. <laughs> but Mike, I just want to make sure. You know Christ as your Lord and Savior, definitely. Good, I'm so glad. Welcome then, brother. All right, I'm going to ask the two ladies uh, that raised your hands, would you please come up here? Just stand in front of the pulpit. For this is your moment. Let's clap for these two gals. Thank you so. Now, Abby, I want you to look behind you, the lady with the hat, because her name is Abby, as like yours is, right? She spells the A-B-B-I. How do you spell yours? Okay, very good. And this young lady, her name is Star. Right? 
is because she's a star. She shines brightly. Would you two stand in front of the pulpit here, please? And just come as close as you can, where you can still see me. You're about to do the greatest thing you've ever done in your life. You're about to change your life so dramatically, and in a good way, I cannot tell you. When I did what you're doing, I was at a crossroads in my life. I was going to go one of two ways, and one was a very bad direction. And I did what you're about to do, and everything changed for me for the better. And I've been happily married to a wonderful woman who loves the Lord since 1980. We're going to be having our 30th anniversary. And I have five awesome children. And two of them are there. Look, look over there. and They're sitting next to each other. My, out of five sons, that's my oldest. Raise your hands again, guys. That's my oldest and my youngest, Mike and Malachi. And they're Christians as well. And they're right now, they're praying for you as well. And so what I'm going to invite you gals to do is to repeat a prayer. We call it the sinner's prayer. And many, many millions of people have prayed this prayer. It's the starting point of your walk with God, your relationship with Jesus. So would you just close your eyes for a moment, bow your heads and repeat after me out loud. Because <clears throat> Romans says with the heart, uh, you believe in God, but with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. In other words, it's your heart and you're vocalizing this prayer. You're inviting Christ into your heart. So say, Heavenly Father, I come to you today and I confess I'm a sinner. I need salvation. I need forgiveness. I need a Savior. I believe in Jesus Christ that he died for my sins and that he rose again on the third day I believe that he will save me and come and live inside of me if I simply ask him so right now the best way I know how I invite you Lord Jesus Christ come into my heart change my life I want to follow you for as long as I live and I promise I will read the word and I'll talk to you in prayer and I will be consistent going to church I want to please you and I want to grow in you Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. I love you, and I can't wait to start my new life serving you forever. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Wow. Don't you feel a little bit different? Feel a little bit better yeah I felt the weight of the world like it came off my shoulders when I got saved I was 15 years old and how old are you may I ask well do you Abby? 14 how old are you 21 God bless you both congratulations welcome to the family of God amen amen now we have a couple of things we want to give you uh, we have these brochures. I really want to encourage you to read these as soon as you get home and just pour up. There's a lot of scripture in there. I wrote these things, but they're all scripture. And they're going to tell you how to get started as a Christian. If you do those things, you're going to grow. And you're going to live a great, great Christian life. And God has so many wonderful plans for you. Okay. Does either of you need a Bible or do you both own Bibles? You don't. Let's get her a Bible, shall we? We're going to give you, is it a New Testament? Or is it a full Bible? What's that? Full. Start with the Gospel of John and just read about Jesus. What he did, how he did it. And then uh, read the Psalms and some of the epistles like uh, Ephesians and Philippians. And it's a good place to start is the Gospel of John. Though. So enjoy your new Bible. Enjoy your life in God. Welcome to the family of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want you to make sure you hug these girls up before they 
ever leave this place. They get so many hugs that they're sick of them. All right. I know you're good at that because I've seen you all do that. And I am done with my part. Thank God for today. Amen. Amen. Two more souls in the kingdom of God. Amen. God is good. All right. Uh, Praise the Lord. What happens next? This is Jeff. I guess you're going to tell us what happens next. We hope you can stay for the party. If you, if you can't, we understand, but you're more than welcome. Well, folks, as you can see, we're ready for football season. Oh. <laughs> no, seriously, welcome to the Father's House Stadium. Yay. <laughs> we're going to have a great time. Uh, it's baseball season. I know baseball already started, but we're still in the beginning out of it. You know, Indians going to win the World Series. Sorry. But <laughs> for all you Pirates fans out there. But um, it's going to be a great time. And uh, I really think we should uh, start out by uh, singing the traditional Ohio song that they sing at all stadiums. What's that? This is Ohio. What are we going to do now? Sloopy let go. He didn't hang on anymore. Well, I guess. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Wow. Happy birthday, Pastor Mike. Oh, my gosh. Look at that. Happy birthday. Oh, we love you, you Pastor Mike. You're so nice. Thank you. Thank you.